Well, hey everyone. So this is Thanksgiving Day of 2023. Instead of being at home, I'm down here uh, working on a Todd engine as usual. Uh, so I thought I would show you what this area is uh, of the engine. Uh, what I'm sitting in is the basically the crank pit of the uh, low pressure side or the cordless side of the uh, of the Todd engine and behind me is the uh, low pressure end of the crankshaft. Um, so right where I'm sitting would be the connecting rod which would uh, tie on to the uh, pin there, the crank pin, and then come down and then just behind the camera uh, would be the uh, crosshead and the crosshead guide and then of course the cylinder. So as part of the restoration of the engine, uh, one of the things that we have to do is um, get, this, get this area cleaned up on both sides. And then also, well, especially on the, for the high pressure side, that connecting rod, uh, the big end, the, where all the babbit is at in the big end of the, uh, of the con rod, all that babbit needs to be melted out and replaced and then machined and put back in because there's a lot of cracking and crazing in the Babbitt. So instead of it being one piece, it's a bunch of little pieces and there's some chunks missing. And if we were going to use that, it would just cause all sorts of problems um, on the crank pin. So at some point that's all going to be melted out um, and then it's going to be re-poured and then machined and then installed. For the initial getting this engine ready to run, um, of course, we're going to do it as a single cylinder engine using only the high pressure side. We're not even going to have the connecting rod in here initially. This will be a later project for down the road. Right now, we just need to get the, uh, the high pressure side done. So, I'll show you what we have here. So here, this massive steel casting is the... Um, I'm drawing a blank, I can't think of the name of it, but, um, oh, the counterbalance end. So, just behind in here is the 23 inch diameter crankshaft, the, the actual shaft itself. And then this is about 12 inches wide, and it's pressed onto that. And then you have the crank pin up there, which is 22 inches in diameter, pressed in. And then you have the return crank on the outboard side, and then finally you have the uh, universal joint connection that goes out to the drive shafts and then out to the rolling mill. Uh, above me, all of this here, this is the, the uh, sheet metal uh, covering, uh, basically just to keep the dirt and grime out of this and keep any of the, the oil from flinging outside the engine. Um, on some of the pictures you may see that this cover it looks like something had landed on the top of it and smashed it it was like that when we got the engine um i think that when they took the drive shafts out they must have set something down on top that was too heavy or hit it or something that, that did that damage uh, eventually we'll we'll get that re repaired um what i'm sitting in this casting weighs eighty four thousand pounds and it's about Oh, 26, 28 feet long, um, one solid casting of iron, and it of course has uh, various pockets underneath it to make it a lot lighter. There's a lot of air pockets under there. This was cast upside down, so when they when they made it at the foundry, uh, this would have been cast down in a pit in the ground, and then the um, the top section of the bowl, the coat, uh, would have been brought down and set down inside and all the cores that hung down that created all the lightning pockets um, in the bottom of this would have hung down from the top and a giant core in the middle that created the, uh, the passageway here which is the, uh, um, the crosshead, or, uh, crosshead guides. And once they got it cast, they took it out, cleaned the casting, and put it in their uh, various machine tools to um, bore this out, to face the uh, machine surfaces on this. Um, so one of the things that 
that we're going to be doing, uh, especially on the high pressure side <coughs> right now, is to uh, get a, uh, a large micrometer and to measure that crank pin. Uh, it, the drawing says it should be um, 22 inches in diameter. So I just purchased on eBay a uh, 21 to 22 inch micrometer, also picked up a 20, uh, 21 inch standard um, so that I can calibrate the micrometer to it. And uh, when we're ready, on the, on the other side, we'll go and remove all the cosmoline off of that, polish it up, and then go around and do a series of measurements. And then we'll use those measurements to make something called a mandrel. Because when you're casting this babbit, so you've got your, your, your connecting rod, and you want to cast that material on the inside of that, but you don't want to cast it solid and then bore it out. You just want enough of a wall of it there that you could then finish machine it. So uh, one of the things you can do is that you make a mandrel, which basically is just a big iron casting, um, rough, the rough diameter of what you're trying to get. And then you take your connecting rod and attach the, uh, the, the rear bearing cap on and, and bolt it down. And you set it down and then have that mandrel sitting in the middle. And then when you pour the metal around the periphery of the mandrel, um, then you unbolt everything after it's um, after everything's cooled down. You take the mandrel out, and now when you bolt it back together, it's the rough size. And then you can put it in the boring mill and bore it out to the finished diameter. And then how we get the finished diameter is with the micrometer figuring out what that diameter is there. Um, so. It's not as if this stuff is going to happen tomorrow or anything like that. We still have a long way to go. Um, it's just that, oh, I got a good deal on a large micrometer on eBay, so I might as well buy the stuff while it's available. Um, and then it's sitting, you know, in storage here on site. And when we're ready to do that, I already have some of the uh, items that I need. Um, as for the Babbitt metal for the new bearings, I have uh, ingots of Babbitt that, uh, that we salvaged out of the steel mill uh, years ago. We also have some of the old Babbitt that you'll melt out. They recommend that you use no more than 50% of the old Babbitt when you're doing the bearing. So we'll divvy it up and put some of the old stuff in and then some of the new stuff. Um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the other things that's, that's gonna happen inside of here that is actually gonna happen fairly soon is as we were talking about the lining up of the engine of getting the crankshaft perpendicular to this bed plate so we're going to use this bed plate and this side as the reference and move everything to be in relationship to this since you know this bed plate and that cylinder are rather large and heavy uh, and it's already in its final location we're just going to move the crankshaft and the high pressure side, which is a little bit lighter, move that stuff around as necessary to get everything lined up. And the one way that I talked about uh, in the last video about uh, piano wire and all that, so you run your piano wire down through the middle of the cylinder, of the low pressure cylinder, down through the middle of the, uh, uh, the cross head bore here. And since this is bored out, round so we've got three locations that we can measure the wire off of to make sure that we're the you know, right dead center of this opening and then that wire goes all the way to the back end outside the engine and is bolted on to a um, kind of some sort of a, of a stand back there that's going to hold it in place and when this wire is dead nuts you know in perfect position from this end of the uh, crosshead guide to the front end of the cylinder, um, then we know that that is the exact center line of the engine. Then we can come back through here and you can take the crankshaft and then you rotate it around to it almost touches that wire. And then you measure from the wire to either face there. That's 12 inches wide. So that wire should be right six inches from one side, six inches from the other. 
Then you rotate the crankshaft around so that uh, crank pin just about touches the wire on the back side, which is a good, well, it's uh, five feet, a good five feet away. And then you measure it again. So it should be six inches and six inches. If it's not, then you know that you're not perpendicular. If you're not, then something is, you know, a little bit uh, off by a little bit of an angle. And then knowing that information, you can then go to the other side and then when we pick up the crankshaft and have it on some rollers and then you can just very carefully nudge it a little bit until you get this measuring in the middle and then on the other side in the middle. So kind of a tedious process because you think about it, well it's off a little bit. Okay, that means you gotta jack up this 230,000 pound crankshaft and flywheel and get it up on rollers and then just barely move it a little bit and then set it back down in the bearings and then rotate it again. Oh, did we get it? Maybe not. Maybe so. Oh, went a little bit too far. Go jack it up, get it back into position. Just keep doing that until you get it where I'm satisfied that it's in alignment. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side too with the high pressure side. I know that's off a little bit. Um, and we'll get that side perfectly aligned too. And then once we have it perpendicular here, perpendicular over there, the crankshaft is level, this bed plate's level, that bed plate is also level. Everything is perfect the way that we want it to be. Then we can start thinking about pouring the concrete underneath all of this and getting everything finally, you know, cinched down to a giant chunk of concrete and it's not gonna move anymore. Um, this is this is not the normal way of doing this because normally with an engine you don't have the crankshaft and the flywheel installed when you're trying to put the bed plates in. We did it completely backwards. We set the engine in place and now we're building a foundation underneath of it. Normally you build a foundation, get everything set up, bring pieces in, you line it up and ground them in place. We're, we're doing it backwards um, because these things are heavy and when we first got the engine, you know, young, poor kid just only had enough money to bring the parts over here. And I only had enough money to basically to pour a concrete slab to, to try to set the engine up on. And, uh, you know, we had, oh, okay, I could have enough money to maybe do the foundation or move the engine parts, but I couldn't do both. And I wanted to get the stuff on the property before the steel mill, you know, kicked us out over there or anything. So, we made this decision to just pour a concrete slab, set everything up on pedestals, and then figure it out later. And this is the later. So, um, so now I got to go through all this process of figuring this all out. But you know, it's it's not impossible. It just takes a little bit of work to do. Uh, so, so all basically, that's that's about all we've got going on 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 what's going on in here. Uh, it's going to be a lot of cleaning, getting everything ready to go. Uh, I'm still working on um, getting the building cleared out of uh, all the other unnecessary stuff so we can start working on all this stuff uh, uh, hot and heavy. Um, but it's, it's just kind of neat here. I'll, I'll, I'll show you some size. So give you an idea of the size of this thing. Here I am, you know, standing here. I can just about fit in between um, of this and uh, this is this is a good 12 inches wide right here I think this is also about 12 inches wide uh, the uh, bearing cap and the main bearings are all right over in there so uh, yeah there's a there's a quite a bit of space in here but this is uh, you know this is what you'd have when you'd have these these big mill engines. I mean, these engines were rather common um, back, when was it? Well, in around 1980 or so, when all the mills started to shut down in Youngstown. There were still 12 rolling mill engines in operation in the uh, Youngstown district plants, including this one. This one ran until the end of 79. But uh, 12 engines, and a couple of them were a lot larger than this one. Um, this would have been a medium size rolling mill engine uh, compared to some of the other ones that were out there. So 
you know, very, very big steam engine. Some of the biggest ones ever built, except for maybe some in, you know, big steamships and the like. But uh, um, steel industry, steam power certainly is, uh, you know, some of the biggest applications of reciprocating steam technology. And uh, we have one of the two steel industry rolling mill engines that's still in existence right here. This is one of the two. So uh, we're going to get her to run again. <laughs> All right, everyone. I think maybe I'll go home a little bit and go have some Thanksgiving dinner. And But I'll be back out of here again tomorrow and again on Saturday uh, working on this because I, there's nothing I'd rather do in life than work on stuff like this. This this is this is my vacation. <laughs> All right everyone, take care and happy Thanksgiving.